এরশাদ হচ্ছে বরকতময় সেই সত্তা যার হস্তে নিহিত রয়েছে সর্বময় কর্তৃত্ব তিনি সর্বশক্তিমান তিনি মৃত্যু এবং জীবন সৃষ্টি করলেন তোমাদের মধ্যে কর্মের দিক থেকে কে শ্রেষ্ঠতা পরীক্ষা করার জন্য তিনি মহা পরাক্রমশালী পরণ ক্ষমাশীল তিনি সাত আসমানকে সৃষ্টি করেছেন স্তরে স্তরে তুমি আল্লাহর এ সৃষ্টিতে কোনো খুদ দেখতে পাবে না সুতরাং তুমি পুনরায় দৃষ্টি ফেরাও কোনো ত্রুটি দৃষ্টিগোচর হয় কি বারবার দৃষ্টি ফিরিয়ে দেখো সে দৃষ্টি শ্রান্ত ও ক্লান্ত হয়ে তোমারই দিকে ফিরে আসবে আল্লাহমা <laughs> আপনি সফল করুন খাস করে ঢাকা চেম্বারের সাথে জড়িত যত মানুষ এই কোভিডে আক্রান্ত আছে আজকের একজন সম্মানিত প্যানেলিস্ট সহ সবাইকে আপনি সুস্থ করে দিন তাদের মধ্যে যারা মৃত্যুবরণ করেছে আল্লাহ তাদের পক্ষ থেকে আমরা ক্ষমা প্রার্থনা করছি আল্লাহ আপনি তাদেরকে মাফ করে দিন আয় আল্লাহ যারা জীবিত আছে তাদেরকে সুস্থ এবং নিরাপদ জীবন দান করুন আয় আল্লাহ আমাদের আগামীর পথ চলা সহজ করে দিন আমিন আমিন বাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহাকেলাহা
the nature and demand of skills in global job market are shifting due to global change and acceleration of disruptive technologies. The World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs reported more than one third of essential skills of current workforce will change. The demand of human centric skills grew as automation becomes more widespread and HR professionals identified the soft skills demand as the important global trend. Ladies and gentlemen, World Economic Forum identified 10 skills and marked emotional intelligence, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, and cognitive flexibility as priority skills to enable young graduates for a future job market. Most employers believe critical thinking and problem solving skills will grow in prominence, and 50% of all employees need reskilling by 2025. In our economic transition, Bangladesh needs to blend conventional and new skills, considering the job market, skills demand, and economic trend. Alongside the new skills, we need to also address improvement of conventional skills to exploit the demographic dividend, as our workforce are diverse by skill and edu education to meet employment needs in home and abroad. On the other hand, many non-traditional ICT-backed venture, online startup, freelancing has emerged contributing new jobs, skills, and economy. They must be backed by four IR technologies, internet of things, blockchain, and cloud computing, and necessary fiscal and regulatory supports for sustainable growth. The online business also needs access to payment gateway, service like PayPal to leverage business growth and economic digitalization. Many LDCs in Africa, like Malawi, Mozambique, use the PayPal to expand business outreach, even though they are not digitally enriched economies. Ladies and gentlemen, taking into account the trend of future job market, we need to overhaul the skills development ecosystem of the country. In this regard, I would like to put forward some recommendations. Strengthen industry academia collaboration to orient emerging skills and redesign the education curricula based on market demand and industry demand. Arrange internationally accredited skills development training to meet the skills requirement of overseas skilled employment. Continuous reskilling and upskilling programs to equip workforce due to technology shift with the support of ILO, UNIDO, and UNDP. Vocational skills Building training, education for the low and semi-skilled professionals need to be arranged to make them more competitive in the job market. Regulatory support, easy access to banking finance and connectivity with international payment gateway service like PayPal for ICT-backed non-traditional businesses. Focused future job trend and conventional new skill mapping and time-bound execution roadmap is needed through shared cooperation of government, academia, and industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not prolong my speech. We urge for our policy and institutional efforts for continuous skill development of our workforce, aligning with local and global economic needs. I believe valued insights of discussions today will guide us in this regard. I would like to thank, thank everyone again for joining today's event. Allah Hafiz. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would like to request uh, Mr. N.K. Mubin, FCA, Senior Vice President, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to conduct the uh, conduct today's webinar. Uh, you're on mute, Mubin Chef. Mubin Chef, uh, Senior sir, unmute. Put okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, may I now uh, request uh, Dr. M. Masur Riaz? Uh, Chairman, Policy Exchange to present his uh, keynote paper. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moveen. Uh, let me just put up the slides on a screen share mode. And uh, yes, I hope it, they're visible to everybody. Yes, yes, it's okay. Put okay. it into the presentation. Yes, now it's fine. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, respected uh, President and uh, Senior Vice President, uh, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industries, board members, uh, members of DCCI, 
very distinguished panelists and uh, today's uh, special and chief guests. Uh, very good morning, Salaam Alaikum. At the outset, uh, let me uh, congratulate Dhaka Chamber yet again uh, for continuing to bring uh, together the important stakeholders to discuss issues of critical importance in light of uh, Bangladesh's development priorities, but also in light of how COVID is actually shaping of the world of business, the economies of the of the nations, as well as well as what it holds for the future of jobs and skills. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, make the keynote in front of this very distinguished audience. Uh, so over the next perhaps 20 minutes, 20 uh, plus minus, uh, I'll try to be as brief as I can, but it is a vast topic. We are going to talk about, uh, you know, this whole idea of future of jobs and skills and how we prepare for a post-COVID world. The presentation is structured into four uh, main themes. Uh, why is this first, why is this jobs agenda uh, uh, important for Bangladesh? Uh, secondly, how has COVID impacted this job scenario and how is it evolving uh, for, and, and what does the whole future hold? Uh, of course, we human being has to be optimistic. I think Bangladeshis are even more optimistic and resilient. So based on that, how do we build back this whole employment landscape better? I, I'm understanding the future or the evolution of the jobs and skills. And finally, uh, strategic and policy options uh, for Bangladesh in terms of building better for uh, you know, uh, more and better jobs through the right skills. So uh, to understand why the jobs agenda matter so much, so critically for Bangladesh, one has to look at Bangladesh's development trajectory, its, its track record and where it's evolving to be in the next 10 years and 20 years and so on. So Bangladesh's uh, economic and social performance, development performance is a highly impressive one and it's a role model for the world. Uh, it, this, this impressive development run has pay, you know, led to triple payoffs, uh, very uh, sort of attractive economic, fast and attractive economic growth rate about six to seven percent sustained rate over a decade. Poverty has been more than halved in last uh, 15 to 18 years. And most importantly, at least in South Asia, Bangladesh has emerged as a country of great social achievements in terms of gender parity, gender empowerment, uh, you know, the uh, mortality, reducing mortality, child more education access, and so on. Uh, and building on this very impressive development performance, Bangladesh rightly aspires to be a developed country as outlined by the Honorable Prime Minister by 2041, uh, which, is, which is the, uh, the 20 perspective plan 2041, which on one hand uh, aspires to sort of uh, achieve uh, elevated targets in terms of investment, GDP of 9% plus, uh, uh, exports of $100 billion and, uh, and, and more, uh, but also outlines the key foundations and focuses for that. And there comes the importance of manufacturing, other economic sectors, which are going to be important for not only growth, but for jobs and the skills and development in light of fourth industrial revolution and ICT evolution as uh, outlined or alluded by, by the uh, Dhaka Chamber President. However, the path ahead is going to be uh, not so easy. Uh, and it requires a revisit of Bangladesh, revisiting Bangladesh's strategy towards private investment and trade and employment generation. Uh, why so? For example, Bangladesh needs to uh, create more than 2 million jobs every year for the youths which were coming into labor market every year. Uh, but uh, about half, about 60 million of Bangladesh's total working age population are now currently employed. So not only we really have to create new jobs for the, for the incoming job aspirants, we also have to create jobs for those who are currently part of the labor force are not, but are not employed or underemployed. At the same time, there are uh, changes happening in the jobs drivers, which all together outline uh, why the jobs agenda uh, is so important in, in light of the emerging jobs challenges. Now, it is also very important that this very impressive development uh, run that Bangladesh had, economic and social, jobs play in that, jobs played a very important role. 
I mean, the gains in employment have been, uh, you know, gains in poverty reduction and prosperity creation has been directly linked to actually the gains in employment, which have been, uh, you know, uh, driven through increase in uh, more productive employment, increase in income or earnings in the jobs. The growth has been uh, mainly job intensive and there were excellent employment opportunities created over the last few decades for women as well as for the rural population. But that said, the challenges are also a plenty and they are evolving. So first and foremost, jobs need to be created and the job drivers which actually contribute in creating job have been uh, sort of, there has been shifts in their evolution. And as a result, as a result, job creation rate has been slowing down. If we look at the employment creation rate, uh, employment growth rate, uh, it has, you know, it fell from 3.1%, which was the case until 2010-11 to 1.8% between 2010 and 2016. This is a jobs diagnostic uh, by the World Bank. Uh, but at the same time, some of the key job drivers, such as the ready-made garment and, and its uh, sort of uh, ecosystem, uh, it has been slowing down in terms of its ability to create new jobs. So the export output of the ready-made garment sector, uh, it far exceeds the, the employment that is created by RMG. So between 2010 and 2016, the RMG export output grew at, at an average of 15%, but the new jobs created by RMGs during the same period was only 6%. And there are also, uh, you know, worryingly downward trends in enterprise formation. The, uh, the latest uh, uh, census, uh, the, the latest uh, manufacturing survey, survey of manufacturing industries by the uh, Bureau of Statistics show that between 2012 and 29, uh, large and medium enterprises have gone down in Bangladesh. Uh, medium by almost 50%, large by even si about 16%. 16 uh, so, but that is not the only challenge, the job creation rate slowing down. There are issues with the quality of the jobs. For example, many of the employed are actually employed in non-waged employment and there are issues about uh, working conditions in many sectors, although it has been improving steadily in key sectors such as ready-made garments. And there is also uh, challenges arising in terms of access to jobs, particularly with regard to priority population whose employment are critical for Bangladesh's future growth, female, uh, rural uh, population, uh, youth, unemployed, youth uh, who are joining the workforce. And uh, unfortunately, the female labor force, particip labor force participation is actually stagnating and in the urban areas, it's even decreasing. And youth unemployment is not a sort of very happy scenario for Bangladesh, sorry, in youth employment. Bangladesh perhaps has the highest unemployment among the educated youths in South Asia. And there are huge skills gap that we are going to talk about more in the, in the next sections. So this is, you know, great, great economic performance, excellent social development, but also, uh, you know, shifting challenges in the country's own uh, jobs employment scenario. Uh, that's when we get this new problem, which is COVID, uh, leading to uh, health and economic crisis. Let's see what sort of fallout, what sort of impact COVID has had on the jobs landscape, both global as well as Bangladesh. Uh, as we know, the you know the economic fallout from the uh, the lockdown, the great lockdown as it being called, has been enormous on the, enormously adverse on the economies. And the global growth rate is gonna be uh, negative 4.4% this year, Euro area, US, Japan, all, all of Bangladesh's exports market are going to grow, uh, you know, their economies are going to contract hugely over the next one year. But if we look at some of the other growth drivers, jobs drivers, uh, you know, they are also on the downward trend. Unter projects, uh, the global investment are, is going to go down by up to 40% in 2020. And so does WTO in terms of global trade, where it projects, it is going to go down by up to 30%. But for Asia, it will go down by up to 36%. SMEs are in trouble. 50% of the SMEs are unlikely to survive, this, particularly the small ones. And uh, the world is going to see the same level of poverty that it has seen last back in 1998, about 60 million uh, new poor uh, joining the below, going 60 million new people up to 
going below the poverty line. Uh, the result is devastating on employment. Uh, according to ILO's latest monitor, about 17.3% of total global, you know, full-time equivalent jobs lost around the world. But in that, the group that is hardest hit are countries like Bangladesh, the lower middle income countries who needed those jobs even more than any other countries or group of countries uh, at a time when they were, many of them were about to jump or graduate to the next level, such as Bangladesh, which is uh, expecting qualification out of LDC in next four years, and perhaps an upper middle income status in next one decade or so. Uh, what it means in terms of labor income loss, uh, it's enormous, almost 5.5% of world GDP, $3.5 trillion. Unemployment is being talked about, but a bigger worry is inactivity, whereby people have employment, but are actually being put into inactive or dormant status due to uh, you know, companies or employers going through difficult time. Uh, one of the lessons that also come to, come, come, come sort of early lessons that come to the table is that stimulus have helped around the world. Without the stimulus, the jobs losses, which is 17%, would have been 28%. However, that say the stimulus or the money is scarce. You know, one country may be richer than the other, but the overall money is something that is always uh, scarce. So there is a deficit of almost $1 trillion in the world for low and lower middle income countries in terms of the stimulus they require. And you can imagine the uh, impact it's going to have on, the, on recovering the jobs in the future. For Bangladesh, uh, again, major setback to this particular development tool as which, as I have mentioned in, the, in one of the previous slides, which turned out to be the biggest enabler of Bangladesh's growth, poverty reduction in the, in the past, and is likely to remain the biggest enabler of Bangladesh's growth uh, in the coming years as well. Uh, according to BIDS, about 13% employment loss. That's out of 60 million total jobs. Uh, that's about you know 7 million jobs lost, 7 million people unemployed in terms of livelihoods and so on. But uh, you know th there is also bad news in terms of the category which needs the category of population which needed the jobs perhaps more than anybody else. Uh, youth unemployment, according to ILO ADB up to 1.6 million youths face unemployment in the next year or so. So a, a report uh, which was done by UNDP and uh, A2I together sheds light on the sectoral distribution of employment scenario as a result of COVID. And the private sector uh, scenario comes very vivid in terms of what is happening uh, in sectoral level jobs through this, this particular uh, table. You can see uh, it projects that about 2.7 million jobs are likely to be lost by an end of 2020. And no surprise that the highest category is actually in the small businesses and informal sector, because we know that's the sector which is, uh, or that's the segment in economy, which is the hardest hit, but that's where the most of the vulnerable uh, also sort of are engaged in terms of their ability to uh, you know, uh, sort of stay, stay on course through this disruption and be able to recover when the economy starts getting back. Uh, now, wh what, does it, what does it sort of hold for the future uh, in terms of how, how do we sort of recover? How do, we, how do we bring back the jobs? How do we continue to create the jobs that Bangladesh was creating? And add to that, the, what Bangladesh needs to create in terms of number and quality, as well as the dimensions of work for future. Now, that would determine how good or how well we can build back the employment landscape uh, in a post-COVID world, reflecting on the lessons and the impact of uh, COVID, as well as what in, you know uh, forces of changes which were in in play even before COVID, such as the. Uh, automation uh, sort of uh, movement, the fourth industrial revolution and so on have been shaping already before COVID. Now, to understand that, first let's look at what does the, what does the economy look like over the next year or two or in the, in the medium term. Now, there, there, there is uh, considerable good news for Bangladesh. As you may have seen uh, in the latest IMF report, the ADB report, even World Bank report, which, which sort of marks Bangladesh which assigns the lowest of the three multilaterals 
uh, in terms of growth, but all of them uh, projects positive growth rate for Bangladesh in the, in the current year uh, or in the next one year. Uh, with ADB projecting that Bangladesh's growth is going to be 6.8%, IMF 3. Point, uh, sorry, 6.8, IMF 3.8, and Bank World Bank projecting 1.6%. So whether it's 1.6 or 6.8, I don't think it matters a lot. What matters is that in such a grim scenario, economically, and where major economies in the world are contracting by 5%, 8%, like India, 9%, uh, Bangladesh is projected to have positive growth, uh, whether it's uh, 1.6 or, or, or 6.8, it won't matter. It, what it means that the bullish outlook will create pull factors for job. And if Bangladesh is ready with the right uh, understanding uh, of how the landscape is, the em employment landscape is going to evolve with the right strategies, Bangladesh can actually certainly build the employment landscape better. But let's uh, first actually uh, chart the waters in terms of uh, what the what what the sort of future of jobs hold. As you can see, uh, building on this bullish economy, again from the UNDP A2I uh, report, uh, Bangladesh does have the prospect of creating almost more than 3.1 million jobs in the 2021. Again, that is going to be something which is, which is going to be uh, which is going to make many nations envy Bangladesh if and if it really happens, if Bangladesh can really pull it together. And no surprise, as we have been talking in Bangladesh and globally, that the, the future job sectors in light of COVID is really going to be in the healthcare, in the ICT and e-commerce, in the food supply chain and so on. And we can see, you know, majority of these 3.1 million jobs are actually going to come indeed from all these sectors. But as I say, whether Bangladesh can indeed pull off uh, and, and get these jobs into reality would really depend on Bangladeshi policymakers and stakeholders, including the private sector, understanding the, the changing waters uh, in terms of employment, both because of COVID as well as pre-COVID forces that were already in play uh, and, and, and charting the waters uh, better in order to successfully do that. So let's uh, try to see what this evolving employment scenario holds for, for the global uh, employment landscape. So it's very important to understand the future of work, the whole concept of work, how it's going to actually evolve. Now, understanding that will it will require understanding the underlying changes or the changes already in, in process in terms of work itself, the workforce, and the workplace. And if we look at work, I mean, what, what is it that is evolving in terms of work? What is, what is the future of work? Now, the notion of work or job uh, so far has been uh, such that it is a collection of tasks or it's an integration of activities which then lead to uh, you know, completion of or, or production of a, of a product or completion of an outcome. Now, that is changing very fast. Work is being disconnected from jobs and jobs and work are being disconnected from companies, which used to offer exclusively the jobs uh, and, and turning uh, sort of very fast into uh, platforms. Now in the new uh, sort of in the coming, coming years, the no, new notion of job is likely to be based on human machine collaboration. And in light of human machine collaboration, what is going to be important is to move away from the uh, you know, the task, the completion of task reality, or, or sorry, completion of task concept to actually a problem, problem solving and managing human relationship concept. That's what jobs work is going to be in the future, including how we unleash the organization's potential through a, you know, continuum of, of talent sources. So from a notion of group of tasks into jobs to actually problem solving and managing relationships. Relationships primarily across the human counterparts, but also relationship with machines and so on. Now, what does it mean for the workforce? In light of this future of work, the workforce concept is going to evolve very significantly. The technology is already changing the way we organize tasks into jobs, the workforce. What do they do? Robotics uh, are changing the way the, the the work is being delivered and at a manufacturing level, for example, automation and rob robotics. But 
uh, also the digital reality. If you look at the digital reality, it's changing the way work is delivered, whether you're delivering it from you know, the core sort of physical places or actually you're delivering or able to transcend the limitations of distance. And the division of labor between human and machines in the future is likely to even tilt more, even more towards machine, uh, resulting in up to 14% job losses in the future. And how is this workforce employer relationship uh, evolving? The social contract, as we say, it is already altered. The, the notion of workforce or the feature of workforce from a sort of lifetime uh, carrier or from you know, a group of people who are curated for lifetime worker or workforce and, and, and henceforth sort of uh, you know, uh, supported in terms of development of their skills and so on, it's changing. The employers now have access to different types of uh, employees full-time, which used to be the case. It's still the case, but there are additional ones, managed services, outsourcing, uh, even governments are outsourcing increasing number of the government to business and government to citizen services around the world. Independent co contractors, and most importantly, in the gig economy, whereby the, the concept of one career or one job uh, over one career or one specialized space in over one career is changing to sort of multiple uh, evolution into multiple jobs or multiple sort of careers or specialization over someone's lifetime. Uh, it's leading to gig workers and crowdsourcing. And the uh, uh, alternate, alternate workforce are also growing. If we see 35% of the US uh, workforce are currently uh, you know, not permanent, they're supplemental, temporary and so on. And if you look at the growth of the freelance worker, it actually uh, you know, out, sort of outnumbers the growth in uh, full-time employees or all, all employees actually by uh, to the extent of four times, it's 8.1% for freelance workers, the growth rate, while it's 2.6% for all uh, employees in the, in the US. And then the finally, COVID has exposed that uh, the workplace, the concept of workplace is also changing very fast. Uh, for digital communication technologies, online marketplaces, changes in market and you know, societal and marketplace evolutions, they have led the employers or they have created opportunities for employers to move from the traditional physical co-located work to actually distant distributed uh, work leading to cost and uh, uh, efficiency upgradation. However, one has to also uh, keep in mind or take note very carefully that this whole notion of workplace should not be limited to only uh, reduction of cost and improvement in efficiency. What is also important to that uh, you know, the importance of workplace, uh, in to, uh, you know, in, 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 in the overall delivery of business is innovation and business results. Uh, the, the teams may have become more distributed, but organizations will have to sort of strategize well so that they, while they gain efficiency and cost reduction, they don't lose out on innovation and developing uh, teams in the form of team culture and bonded teams which bond very well. Uh, so the future uh, of work, as we defined it through the work, workplace, and workforce, it requires new model. It needs to uh, sort of the employers need to businesses need to understand the act their access to both internal and external the entire skills ecosystem in terms of tap tapping into capabilities capabilities that they require uh, to deliver their business. They need to curate uh, when they curate. Uh, what, what needs to happen is actually they need to provide the widest range of opportunities for their workforce to develop their talents as well as their careers and so on. And finally, they need to engage whereby the employers, the leaders, the team leaders, they need to support the teams in terms of building relationship towards productivity as well as uh, business results. So making this future of work more valuable and meaningful would require the employers, the businesses to be more imaginative, understand the shifts or the evolving trends in your industry through specific industry specific data analytics and at, you know, sort of integrating the you know, value meanings, uh, uh, meaning of engagement, meaning of activity into uh, the already uh, important features of efficiency and cost uh, reduction and so on. 
based on the imagination or reimagination, compose a strategy in light of the evolving automation uh, access or evolving, uh, you know, uh, types of contracts between employers and employees, evolving nature of employees that are available in the market and the collaborative workforce. Uh, and then finally, activate. Activate in terms of, uh, you know, the com when you compose a strategy, it needs to be uh, followed up or followed through by the right programs at the organization or at the corporate or at the sort of economy level which then uh, utilize these access to skills, the curation of, of, of uh, you know, competence and engagement uh, in terms of building uh, relationship, in building networks, building uh, productivity to actually uh, better culminate into business results for the corporations and organizations. And COVID has also shown us the importance of uh, you know some of the must-have skills in the context of evolving uh, waters in the in the landscape of employment. Uh, as you see, there are you know Forbes, for example, have come up with eight must-have skills. There are Deloitte, PwC, McKinsey's of the world have also lined you know outlined many uh, the, many of these core features in terms of skills that the employees need to have and the businesses need to curate for success in a post-COVID world, adaptability and flexibility. The businesses will continue to change with or without future pandemics because of business, because of the changing nature of marketplaces, changing nature of market, changing nature of changing demand pattern and so on. And the employees will have to adapt and be flexible and adapt to the new opportunities or the new operating environment for the organizations. Uh, creativity and innovation. Again, any change, as we have seen in the case of pandemic, need employees to be innovative, to the management to be innovative and creative to understand what new or different ways can be de deployed for their organization to be successful, for the businesses to deliver successfully in the context of either sudden changes or the sort of more uh, consistent and, and, and uh, natural changes and so on. Uh, emotional intelligence is something that is extremely important. I mean, again, COVID, uh, COVID as well as, you know, uh, sort of highly, uh, you know, fast-paced, changing nature of business environment show that uh, employees and employers, they not only need to connect in terms of, you know, the new sort of technical skills or soft skills, but they also need to connect at an emotional level, how you identify your emotions expressed, and control and then sort of, uh, you know, utilize that to come to a win-win or common goal uh, between employers and employees. So uh, based on these, let's now see what the, what the sort of, uh, what, what, what are some of the options Bangladesh have in terms of strategies and policies to prepare for the future of these jobs. Now, uh, in, in light of Bangladesh's development context, the economic and social priorities, I propose that uh, there's Bangladesh undertake a three-pronged strategy. Uh, first and foremost, creating the jobs is actually going to be important, particularly because the uh, growth rate of employment, new employment creation is slowing down. And there, there is no alternative to modernize the trade and environment, trade and investment climate of the country, and thereby enable the private sector, uh, which is the engine of growth and job creation to be able to create more and better jobs and absorb these 2 million youths who come to the labor market every year. The quality of jobs is going to be important as Bangladesh uh, uh, you know, continues to uh, sort of go ahead towards an upper middle uh, inch closure to an upper middle income country, uh, graduate from the LDC list. And for that matter, we have to strengthen the systems that protect workers and build resilience, uh, workplace stand, you know, labor standards, uh, labor inspection system, pension system, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and then finally, and very importantly, access to jobs, which has been a critical constraint in Bangladesh's context, particularly for priority uh, part of the labor force, as well as vulnerable parts of the nation, uh, vulnerable population of the nation. And that's where the whole issue of skill comes into play or comes, into, comes to the table in a very prominent way. So let's have a look how or where Bangladesh stands or how Bangladesh fares in terms of skills development. 
I think it's no uh, sort of a mystery or no sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not, a, it's a no brainer that actually Bangladesh's current skill scenario is not actually uh, supportive of its development aspiration to become a upper middle income country by next decade and a developed country by 2041. If we look at the global skills index uh, by Corsi, uh, Bangladesh stands 57 out of 60 country in both technology and, and data science skills. And when it comes to business skills, it's little better. However, the, there is still a very long way to go. It's only 47 out of 60. A very interesting assessment that we had done uh, when I was part of the World Bank group, I, we had done this back in 2016, this assessment based on UN Com trade data. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh, is a very, it's a, it's a well-known success story in terms of its export performance. But even in that very successful space, if we look at the contribution of skills intensive manufacturing among the total uh, export, the export per capita for Bangladesh is very low. It's $3 per capita, whereas South Asia average is $20, $35. And a comparator country, which is now drawing a lot of attention in Bangladesh and elsewhere, Vietnam is $223. And China stood at $763. So it gives you a sense where skills stand in terms of something that we have been doing so well. And it is something that is continue, that will continue to remain a big cornerstone of our export-led growth strategy or economic growth strategy in the, in the future. Uh, so what's, what holds back uh, the skills development in a way that Bangladesh needs it to fulfill its development aspiration? So what's important is actually to look at the whole ecosystem of skills. I mean, it may look like a Christmas tree, but if you go one by one, I think it'll, it gives you a sort of easier or simpler representation. Let's look at the skill demand side. There are issues with the demand side where we have the, uh, you know, the investment climate or the trade environment, which creates the demand, which creates the jobs, then the technology and the overall regulatory systems. So we have uh, issues like a you know, predominance of informal economy, about 87% of Bangladesh's economy are still activities and the jobs are still in, in the informal economy. It creates a great barrier towards skills development. It's very difficult for informal enterprises to understand and access and then deliver skills development needs. Uh, there is technology as we have discussed and we all know is going to shape the labor market and employment uh, prospects significantly, but Bangladesh does lag behind in terms of an, an understanding and establishing the evidence in terms of how technology is going to affect Bangladesh's own growth drivers, the sectors that Bangladesh has potential on or are excelling. Uh, and then also there is very poor knowledge uh, across, uh, or, you know, sort of across this demand side about the current and future uh, you know, uh, skills gap or skills requirement. If you look at the supply side, uh, the issues are equally uh, sort of grim. The first and foremost, we have a lot of graduates coming out from universities and colleges, but what we have uh, sort of consist, what we consistently hear from employers and experts and government as well, is that the employability of these graduates are quite low. So they have a certificate, but they don't necessarily have the basic skills uh, let alone the technical skills to be to be able to deliver the job, even the, in the initial days. Uh, the soft skills elements are missing. Uh, there is a sort of increasing emphasis on vocational and technical skills, which is good, but the, without the soft skills, the fundamentals do not grow in these uh, potential labor market participants. Uh, curriculum, how uh, modern that is and how relevant that is in terms of the demand of the economy, there are questions around that. And there are issues with the private sector as well. I mean, the employers themselves, uh, they do not invest or they're not incentivized enough to invest into workplace training or on the job training, which is a very critical part of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, sort of a skilled workforce development. There are issues around industry uh, training uh, or skills ecosystem, uh, sorry, skills supplier, uh, you know, uh, confluence. Uh, we know that while there is the NSDA is taking uh, excellent steps through the industry uh, councils and so on uh, to actually strengthen, establish and strengthen the links between the 
training curriculum, the tra skills development initiatives and the industry for better relevance and quality, but it needs to uh, strengthen the collaboration and coordination and efficiency a lot more than where it is now. And uh, finally, the individuals, the job aspirants themselves, there is there are uh, certain issues which also constrain their own uh, you know, contribution in skills development. For example, there is a uh, something that is uh, that is more social, like the so, you know, there are perceived low social status in terms of acquiring technical skills and vocational skills. Whereas the demand and availability and potential of getting more employment created is certainly more in that space than in managerial and other uh, sort of highly skilled category. Uh, so what can be done about uh, this? So my final two slides. Uh, some policy consideration. Uh, I think there is already a lot of talk about that and some steps, but Bangladesh needs to very quickly put in place a long-term skills strategy uh, followed by a program or a master plan, which aligns very strongly and very closely with the national growth strategies. What is going to be the growth, what is going to be the growth strategy for Bangladesh in next 10 years and 20 years? How much of agriculture and agro processing importance are going to be there? How much of manufacturing and services uh, importance are going to be there? How much of, uh, you know, outward orientation, uh, part, you know, my, sort of sending uh, skill, semi-skilled and unskilled and perhaps one day more skilled uh, employees to, to the sort of global employment markets and so on. So they, I think the long-term skill strategies are being talked about. Some documents are already there. But what we still don't see is a close link to how Bangladesh sees itself driving its economic growth in the next decade and perhaps in the next two decades, keeping in mind the perspective plan of 2021. There needs to be greater public-private partnership in delivery of skills because evidence has shown that it helps in uh, you know, high skills matching and also very high employment outcomes. Uh, regulatory reforms are now in order. Uh, it, particularly in light of COVID and sort of post-COVID realities. For example, we know many companies like Grameen Phone, we have uh, Azman Bhai, the CEO here, but also many other companies who, are, who employ international you know, human resources uh, who cannot really work from the, coal, you know, the physical offices due to movement restriction, travel restriction, so on. And there are uh, regulatory issues or practices whereby you know, uh, payments, salaries, transfer of, uh, you know, funds to those employees or contractors become uh, very complicated as the, the regulations currently in place have been written 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when people did not think of distributed workplace, digital realities to deliver work and things like COVID and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, quality and relevance in curriculum uh, has to be a lot more through better industry partnership and job placement services. Uh, a few more, uh, the sustainability of this industry skills councils, which is a great initiative. And um, I think this is something Bangladesh can certainly uh, draw upon in terms of uh, sort of uh, using Bangladesh, their, their ability to bring together the supply side, demand side, and bringing more relevance and quality there needs to be a greater sustainability of this industry skills council, both in terms of capacity, but also their ability to continue to support Bangladesh. And in the same line uh, of sustainability, uh, there is certainly no disagreement that Bangladesh needs more private sector training providers, but in the past subsidies or support from government as well as development partners, which to some extent was necessary at certain point and perhaps still necessary in some areas, I think there is a need to come up with a strategy whereby the subsidy elements can be done away with gradually or within a sunset time and the bus greater business orientation can be brought in into the private sector training provider uh, sort of space. So let me stop here um, and, and uh, sort of I'll be very happy to uh, sort of listen to the panelists remarks and come back uh, during the open discussion for any clarification question. Thank you once again to DCCI president and senior vice president for giving me the opportunity. Thanks, uh, Dr. Masur Riyaj, for really a nice and informative presentations for us to discuss today. Uh, I see four main points here. 
Bangladesh's massive economic growth demands better human resource development for which we need strategic alignment amongst employment, investment, and trade. Massive job loss in lower middle income countries and women due to COVID pandemic. Requirement of new skill sets for future jobs in line with current bullish economic pace of Bangladesh. And lastly, the requirement of a strategy and policy support for future jobs. Let's now move uh, into our distinguished panelists today. We have uh, four panelists. Uh, to speak on the issue. Uh, firstly, I uh, request Mr. Rahat Ahmad, founder, partner, and CEO of Anchorless Bangladesh to briefly share his valued comments on today's discussion for topic. Mr. Rahat, thank you very much for joining us today. I would also expect you to highlight issues and challenges you are facing in venture capital in the startup business ecosystem in Bangladesh as it is an emerging sector of the country, of the economy. Also, we'd like to hear what Ankulus Bangladesh is doing to create a scope for work for the youth in this pandemic situation or in upcoming post-COVID environment. Mr. Rahat, over to you. Thank you, thank you for having me today. Uh, <clears throat> I'll uh, start off with a little overview of what Ankulus Bangladesh is. So we are a international venture capital fund based out of uh, New York City uh, that is focused 100% on investing into the Bangladeshi startup ecosystem. We are, as far as we know, the first of our kind to effectively take Western capital and deploy it here in the early stages of funding where we don't ask for collateral, we don't ask for profits, we don't ask for dividends. We just want the companies to grow uh, at a hyper uh, rate over the next five, 10 years. Um, and the part that makes me very excited about it is the founders that we are backing are Bangladeshi, which means when the companies do well, the wealth is being generated on the ground uh, amongst the Bangladeshi population. Uh, to date, we have invested in three companies. We are working on our fourth. What we look for when we invest, and this feeds into the conversation that we're having today, what we look for when we invest are companies that take advantage of technology to scale faster and faster. Um, and, and a couple of things that we really are dependent on are a, a mindset from founders uh, that are global, uh, which is to say, you know, I've walked into the cafeteria at Intel before, and I think one out of every 10 persons were, were Bangladeshi, right? Uh, what we know from looking at Bangladeshis around the world and the success stories of Bangladeshis around the world is if you give a Bangladeshi access to capital, and if you give a Bangladeshi access to the right resources and expertise, we are capable of building any company that we need to do. And that is kind of our goal here, is to find these founders who we believe have this global vision to build these fantastic companies that have the highest standard possible and uh, give them access to the capital and, and resources as necessary. And so two of the companies that we have publicly discussed or publicly uh, announced our investment in, one is in the truck freight sector. Um, that's interesting because that's a $10 billion plus market in Bangladesh alone, yet the digitization of the industry is very much lacking. In what we have seen, you know, we've seen, for instance, we talk about e-commerce a lot in Bangladesh. The problem with e-commerce is logistics is still, you know, we're like 20 years behind in logistics. We need to improve that. And in order to improve that, we need to have a new mindset in terms of how to take it to the next level. And once that happens, that actually becomes a foundation for e-commerce and other um, types of different types of distribution that we're currently lagging behind in. Um, on the other side, we made an investment in a company called Gaze, which does artificial intelligence uh, API, which is to say basically they built a piece of software that any developer anywhere in the world can download and utilize no matter where they are. So this could be a developer in Ukraine, could be a developer in Brazil. But what it says is that Bangladeshi engineering has suddenly built a product that can be usable by anybody in the world and of a certain standard. That says a lot about what our talent is capable of. Um, so th that's kind of how we're approaching this. Um, we are very excited to see the talent. Now, <clears throat> this goes back to another question uh, or another thing that was just brought up. Um, why is Bangladesh not getting more funding? So in the history of Bangladesh, we have had $300 million of funding in venture. In contrast, India usually can do these $300, uh, $300 million rounds on any given day. Um, 
when it comes to pure early stage venture for every person in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh and, and, and India, India have roughly the same GDP per capita. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have uh, raised about 95 cents per person. In contrast, India has raised about $30 per person. In Indonesia, that number is closer to $40. Where is the gap happening? So I've spoken to a lot of regional venture capitalists in Asia, um, asking them, well, why haven't you come into Bangladesh? And the two things that really stick out uh, are, are, are telling, and it's something that we do need to embed into our, our youth and in our, into our employment. First is the founders here don't think big enough. Uh, the idea that they're going to solve a problem for their local neighborhood is not sufficient. They need to think about solving a problem, not only for the country, but also beyond the country. Because again, a Bangladeshi doesn't have to limit themselves to just Bangladesh. Uh, number two, and this is where the idea of emotional uh, intelligence comes in, it's the idea of just having basic soft skills. Uh, how do you send an email? How do you communicate? Uh, how do you, um, you know, follow up to an email? These are things that have a global standard, yet these are not being taught in our education. These are not being taught in our schools. Um, social media is a complete mess. I don't see privacy settings done that, the, the way they, are, they should be done. Um, photos, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complete mess. I have to be completely honest. And, we actually actively sit down with our founders and, and give feedback to this. It's like something as simple as capitalizing your name in your email goes a long way in showing your attention to detail. So if I'm going to invest in you, I know, hey, at least they have the ability to make that small change. So all, all of this comes, kind of comes together. Now, if we are to take a step back from just the startup space, because startups only exist when the talent exists. And one of the biggest issues that we're seeing in terms of talent is we do have a disconnect in terms of what I, I personally think Bangladesh should be focused on overall. Um, I think the most important asset Bangladesh has is the human brain. And uh, you'll hear me talk about this quite often is I think our, our youth are very smart. They're very, very smart, but they're often not getting the detailed focus on what they need in order to move forward. So one of, the, one of the things that I often kind of talk about is robotics, right? And it's actually not robotics in the sense that I don't think we should be doing robotics. Robotics requires high capital expenditure, lots of R&D. You may not see a return for years and years and years, maybe a generation or two. Why would we take on that when we're lagging behind? We're playing catch up with the rest of the world right now, right? So in that case, we are better off finding, you know, 10,000 impressive talent and training them in Python right now so we can have them take $70,000 jobs that otherwise would cost $300,000 in the US, right? And these engineers that we're running into are incredibly capable. Now, if you take the next step, um, you think about how do you upskill them? How do you actually get these talent to work out? And this is where, you know, I, I think there are personnel here from the financial community in the United States, we have, uh, you know, some interesting organizations like Lambda that are doing ISAs, income sharing agreements. So you go into, and this is very similar, funnily enough, to what the Brazilians do with soccer. Uh, they go into the favelas, they find really interesting talent, and they say, you know what, we're going to pay for your soccer training for the next 10 years. If you're really good, we will take a part of your contract down the road. You go to madrasas right now, you could probably find potentially really brilliant children who could be incredible coders. You put them through trading and you say, listen, if you are able to get a job with a company, the, uh, whoever the operator is, we take 20% of your salary. There are ways to do this in a, in a kind of a financial engineering basis where everybody ends up being winners. But I think what we should focus on at the end of the day is figuring out how do we bring more wealth into Bangladesh instead of focusing on things like salaries and, and uh, things that go out elsewhere. Now, I have heard the thing where um, you know, my, my, in venture capital, if you bring in, say, $30 million, right, $30 million doesn't seem like a lot of money. I have heard the counter saying, hey, I've had a Japanese factory come in. That's a billion dollars. That Japanese factory is owned by the Japanese. So when that factory is built, the money that comes into the Bangladeshi economy is still the salaries and the, and the construction costs, etc. But every time a worker goes into the office or the factory and does something and they walk out that night, the money that is generated, the wealth that is generated, it still happens for the Japanese organization. How do we fix that for Bangladesh? We have the companies be owned by the Bangladeshis. And that's what I think is really important about how we fund our youth to make sure that they can have ownership and wealth creation on the ground. 
which then can fall into you know a waterfall of of other investments and other uh, company creations. Um, in the United States, we have a famous kind of group called uh, the Patel Mafia. People who are uh, not Patel, PayPal Mafia. People who worked at PayPal. Everybody from you know Peter Thiel to um, Elon Musk, who then left and created amazing companies. Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn, another one. We started joking around here about the Patel Mafia because we're seeing more and more uh, founders who previously worked at Patel spinning out and building their own startups that we are now interested in funding. We need to foster more of this kind of support to get these younger kids and believe in them because at the end of the day, the dollar amount that we're actually allocating to them is not that much, but it's also realizing what we should prioritize and the skills that need to be developed locally. So yeah, that, that's kind of where, where I'd like to wrap up for now. Um, I think in a broader picture, we do need to focus on detailed uh, skills that need to be done. I know we, we can talk about the high level, but for instance, again, it's data science, you know, people who can understand R, um, Python, um, people who can do React development. That is a huge gap in the market globally that we can come in and fill the gap in. So look forward to having a discussion in more detail about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arat, for your uh, valuable and informative comments. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Yassi Rajman, CEO of Gravin Fund Limited, to talk on the issue. Mr. Rajman, thank you very much for joining us and giving your time here. I request you to share your valued thought briefly on the keynote presentation, as well as to talk about the future skills change and demand particularly in the telecommunication sector as it is highly technical and critical sector of our economy. Additionally, you know, Bangladeshi digital entrepreneurs are facing problem to ship their products to the Amazon stores without LC documentation. Could you please suggest us how government can address these newly emerged issues and facilitate policy guidelines to cope up with it? Mr. Azman, over to you. Thank you, uh, and came moving, uh, moving by, and all the distinguished participants, panelists, and special guests in today's session. And thank you for inviting me into this session. I think I just reflect on the key. You know, the speaker uh, highlighted a few things. You know, we talk about uh, the youth in Bangladesh. Uh, numbers may vary from some talk about 35 to even 70, 75 million youth in Bangladesh. Uh, we constantly talk about the growth we have seen in Bangladesh GDP growth. Uh, we have a rising literacy rate in Bangladesh. If you see the uh, PR countries, you know, it's like we are ahead in terms of the way we are progressing in terms of at least the percentage of literacy. Uh, much, much better probably the financial inclusion. You know, it's like I have heard in the global uh, different platform people are talking about in Bangladesh, only 3% people have access to credit card plastic card, but people are entirely ignoring that more than 50% actually using mobile financial services, which is not very common even in adjacent countries uh, in Asia. And then we, we also heard about, you know, it's like the projections, uh, the Bangladesh uh, government ambition by a uh, certain time to become the uh, mid-income country. At the same time, uh, recently all we have read that uh, World uh, Economic Forum talking about by 2030, we are gonna be 24th, you know, the largest economy. A ADB talks about the GDP growth for the next year. So all these roles, the picture that uh, the encouraging words, the confidence on Bangladesh, it's coming from probably this resilient nature of the people in Bangladesh and the demography. And more, you know, it's like if you zoom in, the youth, the potential they can bring in, be it, you know, as a skilled workforce or be the entrepreneur into the country. But the question is, if we are not, if we are not able to basically ignite, inspire them to take on these challenges, then all those big, thing, big dream that Bangladesh is gonna be like this is to me is a questionable. So, so how are we basically in this session is my question when I face, when I, I talk about, I lead my company, I face the, how do we basically encourage this youth? There are 
if I put up a one job requirement, there are, you know, within a day, 300, 400 people knocks that I would like to apply for this job. But how do you encourage and inspire them to acquire that right skill? Who is guiding them? There are always some pioneers. They will take their own path. You don't have to basically tell them what to do. And there are some followers and they will follow those pioneers. But there is a large segment. They need some leadership. They need the stories from this community what we are here today to inspire them to find out to build those right skill, to find out the access to those fund. You know, otherwise these words get missed. I, I'm just bringing a little different perspective because today, after this, there's another session CTO forum is conducting, it's more or less the same session. And then in the evening, there's another session BLYC is conducting, more or less the same session. So we all are basically in different forums. We are talking about this potential, we're talking about the possibilities, but what is story we can bring into our youth? That's very important to me. And that's what probably I would like to basically work with a couple of you, if possible, to bring in from and, and, and shape up together, private, public, uh, uh, together to shape and inspire them. You know, to me, an skilled force, a skilled youth is actually having the freedom of choice. And is he aware of that? You know, it's like, I, I would like to give the example of my company that we are not able to retain good resources we have developed because they have the freedom of choice. They can decide on, I would like to work for a startup, not Grameen phone. Only 24 years old Grameen phone now became a big old company. They don't see there is anything exciting anymore. They would like to work for shop up. I'm, I'm telling you the true story. I could not basically retain my resources, giving all sort of opportunities to them, but they went for a new company, new startup. And that's the freedom of choice and youth are having in their hand if they are skilled, but they are not probably aware of that where to go, what sort of skills we are talking about, how the world is being changed. As a telco company, Mobin Bhai, you asked for to reflect on, I am seeing everything is changing. It's like you work for Grameen Phone, I am, I am still working for Grameen Phone. The, the, the things I built 15 years back, today I have to rebuild entirely differently. Talking about the distribution, you know, how many of us paid through, let's say, Bikash a year back? It's a simple example. It's not a big funda. It's not a big technology something. But it is a change. In during this COVID period, we found out because of the people mobility across the country, we had to have 40,000 tuning in our network because our people are usually in the cities and our network is usually targeting in these big high rising buildings. But all of a sudden, they got scattered all over the country. And now you need to tune it. And, and it was a humongous job being, a, being led by human. But there are technology which can do it within hours. So now question is that shall we able to avoid that technology, that analytics driven technology? If we try to continue avoiding those, we will not be sustainable into the market. Somebody else will take over that market. And that is why this skill, I see that be it in technology, be it in finance, be it in distribution, Grameen Phone is facing that challenge that we need to basically develop this skill and inspire our employees to focus, to reskill, up skill by themselves. Otherwise, somebody else will replace them. I'll give you just simple one last example what we see in Grameen Phone that, you know, it's not that something big robotics or automatic. It's a very simple thing. 
we used to basically whenever we take on board a corporate client we have to have manually do all the client's information putting into the system and a mail going on to the client the client replies everything is fine and then we know we activate this simple thing with a simple robotics automation is possible within few minutes and it saves a day man hour now question is i have an employee he is doing that and he will continue doing that but tomorrow someone else will come with a completely new technology new way of work and my operation will not be sustainable with that sort of efficiency and we sort of a skill level so what we see that when we say that by 2030 that that we will become like 24th you know largest economy by 2030 at the same time 800 million jobs will be taken over by robotics or automation so this is both together and are we able to manage so my message would be towards towards the youth those are basically in the job sector or 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 in the uh, be, want to be an entrepreneur you know is it's try to spend time more than you know your regular curriculum learning you can learn is something a skill and learning is something is possible otherwise we will not be sustainable you know it's like there are more you know better equipped technologically you know uh, learned people are there ceos are there they will replace us so we need to constantly and continuously learn and apply new things at the same time we need to inspire our youth to basically join into this journey i to me it is more important to tell the stories to youth to ignite them and when we talk about these stories and skills we probably focus on this personalized marketing cloudification we talk about ai data analytics data engineering but to me there are two more things ex- extremely important all those automation cannot bring your soft skill all those automation cannot bring your human skill where is that human skill and soft skill these three if are not coming in combination because world will open up today our economy is based on if rmg and remittance our youth skill resources will not only for work for bangladesh their opportunities beyond the border and they are the transparency you know clarity honesty these things will also be equally important when we talk about the hard skill so i do believe that for us Uh, if i talk about that skill development and engaging youth and really unleashing the potential of bangladesh and in, and branding bangladesh in the global scale i would say it's time to t- tell the right stories to the youth to inspire them ignite them and come government and private sector come together to give a platform where they can acquire this skill and these skills are not only hard skill hard skill soft skill and human skill in combination mobin bhai i would like to stop here if you had another one probably something you wanted to yeah. i think it's okay thank you thank you very much so thanks sir, for your very elaborate and practical comments which is mostly based on your reality and you highlighted two points uh, the human skills and soft skills along with the hard skills i think those are really important and we must uh, consider those in our planning process or policy making process to develop this area okay let's move to our third speaker uh, now i would like to welcome miss marian wellers program manager generation unlimited unicef bangladesh miss marian Now, would you please uh, briefly share your valued views on today's discussion, and what is your experience specifically working with vocational program of young people to harness their skills in utilizing the demographic dividend? Also, uh, we like to know 
for generation unlimited is working we know that generation unlimited is working to facilitate employment generation and skilled manpower development through reskilling and upskilling dcci business institute dbi is also working in the same domain since 1991 therefore do you have any scope to work with dbi to achieve our common goals of employment generation and skill manpower development ms marian you have 5 minutes to speak on the on this area thank you thank you very much and thanks for giving me this opportunity i'd like to say that i really enjoyed the presentation from dr masru i think it was very clear and really inspiring and also from the two last speakers uh, really really uh, good points and and you know i will i think i will echo a lot of what has been said already um so just maybe a few words about generation unlimited uh, here in bangladesh uh, so generation unlimited is actually a global partnership platform that was initiated by unicef a couple of years ago in fact in in fact in 2018 in 2019 here in bangladesh we decided to uh, also form a a partnership platform here uh, uh, and 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 with the same focus so the focus is really to help young people age 10 to 24 become productive and engaged members of society and how do we want to do this this is about connecting secondary education and training to employment and entrepreneurship and we've all talked about the issue of connectivity this is the most important thing how do we connect education outcomes training outcomes to the the market this is really the core focus of the generation unlimited but taking it from a from a you know collaborative a uh, co-creative and partnership perspective so uh, the the aim is really to modernize secondary education and training and to build those skills and we have all talked about soft skills or transferable skills we think uh, in genu we think that transferable skills is found foundational is not something that should just be in curriculum development curriculum reform it has to be in tvet education and training it has to be something that our private sector colleagues uh you know help shape up you know through job placement perhaps and job training right it's very very important because if we just focus on 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 curriculum develop, development we can wait for 10 more years before we have a generation that then have the transferable skills that's needed in the market and there is an urgency as we all know right so so this is one point the other one point uh, that that gen u is focusing on is fostering job preparation and it's linked to both hard and soft skills right so you know we can use apprenticeship method mentorship and also entrepreneurship so it's not just about the big industries it's also about as uh, mr yasir said uh, uh, you know encouraging and inspiring young people to help develop these uh, jobs and these businesses that are needed in bangladesh today through entrepreneurship training through uh, uh, entrepreneurship capacity you know and then of course we focus on quality work opportunities you know both whether we are talking about you know uh, sort of uh, um, different sectors quality work decent work has to be there and then another thing that uh, mr yasir also pointed out this whole issue of engaging young people as problem solvers as the positive agents of social change is really really key so right now if if i'm honest the Gen generation unlimited partnership platform in bangladesh engages uh, uh, development partners like unicef ilo uh, a2i is very much involved brac is involved uh, uh, we are just now re-engaged in private sector so uh, the metropolitan chamber of commerce and industry is a partner now and 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 this is really important because we need to connect you know we gen u can help connect uh, the skills uh, skills uh, agenda Uh, with the private sector agenda much better than what's done now right so um, so i think you know uh, and 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 another issue is young people are not really there to be honest so engaging young people not just in participation but in what's really important for them in creation of jobs and in you know uh, uh, helping shape the economy i think is key so generation unlimited is that partnership platform that that can help bring a uh, business and uh, uh, the skill sector closer to young people but young people need to be in the middle you know we need to we need to consider uh, the issue that you know very soon 
Bangladesh will go into be, becoming an aging society. So we have that golden opportunity right now. So this is really, really important. You know, um, so while we are from UNICEF's side and other partners' side, together with Ministry of Education, focusing on, on uh, curriculum reform, we need to do uh, much more urgent actions that can help with proof of concepts of how do we really upskill uh, adolescents and young people? How do we make sure that transferable skills can be taught, you know, everywhere at the, at the job, you know, in, in the job market, you know, through informal types of training opportunities that could be certified. And of course, you know, through a TVET and so and so on. The other urgency and the other issue that, that we are struggling with as Gen U and, and not just in Bangladesh, not just this government, not just this the private sector, is the digital divide. This is a real thing in Bangladesh. So, you know, think about the fact that, you know, um, it's more than 30% of uh, people in Bangladesh that are not uh, connected, right? About 50% in the cities are connected. More than 30% are not connected digitally. And about only 10% of women actually have skills so they can work in ICT, right? So, uh, so, so there are things that we need to work on that has, to, that has been, uh, you know, opening our eyes because of COVID-19. COVID-19 is now showing us that actually young people are not necessarily connected. So they can't access education right now. And it'll take a while before they can access education. You know, so we are not using the opportunities that are out there. So we also need, I think, to the private sector, the business community, community to help bridge the digital divide. And I'm sure that Graham and Phone and others are already doing that, but we really need to make sure that we can, you know, uh, uh, let's say, support those young people that are not that are not getting any support, and so we don't lose them. And so we use the, their 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 skills and their opportunity, you know, in the market as well. So it's a it's a sad thing when we see uh, people that are, are lost, young people that are lost because of poverty and because of uh, not being connected, right? So this is the whole thing about the brain, the human skills are there, but you know, they're not connected to the market. They're not connected to education and training opportunities. So, so uh, these are very big uh, issues. And I think that next steps for Generation Unlimited in Bangladesh is to focus more, to maybe develop proof of concept, to look at one sector, not five sectors, and maybe within one sector, look at one part of that sector and then connect the skills uh, councils, the relevant skill council and the business uh, community and the young people around that, you know, uh, and, 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 and test out how do we actually uh, develop these skills right now and, and how do we get better at projecting where the jobs are, right? So this whole issue of developing data platforms where we don't just have the, the skill sector, but also the private sector with the demand side information is really, really important as well. So data, uh, you know, ensuring better connectivity between the skill sector and the young people and the private sector. Um, and then of course, uh, I think uh, looking at transferable skills as something foundational now. Hard skills is important, mathematics, STEM is important, but if we are not, having the, the problem solving, critical thinking, you know, all this it, as a DNA for young people, then, you know, the, the, then, then it's not going to be easy to overcome uh, challenges in, in the society, whether they are social challenges or economic challenges. I think that's, uh, but, and working together, I want to encourage, you know, this whole, this, this meeting is part of that, right? And we have had many, many meetings where we are talking about the issue, but now let's get to work and let's, you know, work together collaboratively between government, private sector, and and the, the skill sector, but in a, and young people, but in a very very practical way. And I think that Jen, you would like to promote that, but we need your help as well. We need the chambers help, the private sector help to do that. So thank you very much. Looking forward to further cooperation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Marion. Uh, very nice comments and very briefly elaborate the whole thing, what you are doing. And obviously, we look forward to work with you uh, because we have a similar institution so where, where we can work together and talk mm -hmm. from this area and what the general development of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, we, ha we had another uh, 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 discussion panelist, but he regretted to join. So we are now moving into our uh, uh, special guest uh, uh, panelists. So firstly, uh, 
I am requesting uh, Mr. Dulal Krishna Saha, Executive Chairman, National Skills Development Authority. Sir, you are here. Can you hear me? Mr. Dulal, yes, sir. Yes, uh, I can. You just, you need to unmute. This is okay. Yeah, yeah, sir. Can you hear? Can you hear yes, 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 we can hear you. Uh, sir, thank you very much for joining us in this session as one of the special guests. We are really delighted to have you. Sir, we know NSTA is an apex body for skills development in Bangladesh. You already have completed skills mapping for few sectors and forecasted how much skilled manpower will be required and in which sector. Initiatives are also ongoing to facilitate those skills development program. How DCCI Business Institute and DBI College can be your partner in capacity building of Bangladesh private sector entrepreneurs and professionals. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mobin. At first, I'd like to pay my thanks to Dr. M. Mashur Reja, presenter. He, he has given an excellent paper. Hope it will be helpful for me. Actually, NHT is a new born baby. It is started in 2019. And now we are working. It is a lots of challenging. NHDP 2011 is prevailing and we are working on NHDP 2020. Uh, 2020, it may be 2021. Actually, Bangladesh currently stands an important course and crossroad of economics, human and social development. Among other, strong focus on human resources development, including skill training, is an important part of this impressive economic and social transformation. On the other hand, the rapidly growing economy particularly the modern manufacturing and service sectors is expressing acute shortage of skilled workers. On the other hand, there is high unemployment rate and joblessness among young people, particularly educated young. This phenomenon of joblessness constitutes a major cause of concern for the planners and policy makers in the country and overview making population of the labor force, about 80% is engaged in informal employment. More than 55% of the Bangladesh expatriate are semi-skilled or low-skilled, resulting in low wage earning. Therefore, preparing the potential workforce for the labor market, both domestic and overseas, to appropriate skill training is of utmost importance. And in this view, NHD is working. There are lots of challenges prevailing for us. We can supply uh, skilled workers to the industry according to the, their desire. There is a skill gap prevailing here. Now, we're working on the uh, certification of freelancers. Uh, we are making a guideline. And also, we try to establish a skill portal for the future job seekers also, and also industrialist or ICS. We are working with ICS. We have only 13 ICS. We are making another three, and hope if we active our ICS, and also we making a good relation with the industries, that means industry's link is okay. And NHDA create a good opportunity for the news of seekers. And also new environment. There is, a, there is another challenge for us. COVID-19 has brought massive challenges in the socio-economic context and the skill economy in Bangladesh, especially in relation to the labor market, youth employment, and skill trading. I agree with the CEO, Grameenpo, Mr. Yes, it husband. 
it clearly uttered that we need hard skill, soft skill, and human skill. We are working on this way. It's slants for us. We have lots of problems. We need a standard, we need curriculum, we need assessors, we need assessment tools, and we need online platform and also competency standard. But we are hopeful. We are working with the help of the government, but we need a good relationship with the NGOs, with the government bodies, and also private sectors. If we coordinate with this, all the sectors, so NHDA take a good role to people the manpower, to people the skilled people for the new work environment. It is really a challenge for us. We are working. I, I joined this institution 1st November. That is my, this is the first challenge and also it is my tangible place that we can, I'm working with all of you and I need your help and cooperation for establishing NHDS program and activities. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dulal, um, for your nice and valuable comments, particularly uh, you elaborated on what NSDA is doing. And we uh, very much like to join with you uh, in the future on certain areas to work together. Uh, our next special guest is Mr. Sudip Mukherjee, Residence Representative UNDP. Sir, you are addressed to us. Mr. Sudip. I can, yes. I, okay. I can, Thank I you can. very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sudipta, for joining us and for your valuable time. Uh, we like to hear uh, on our topics today and also the keynote presentations. Sure. Uh, we also uh, like to know, uh, uh, we, we know that the UNDP is one of the major development partners of Bangladesh since its, its independence. Uh, what are the avenues where UNDP projects are coming in the near future? Is there any possibility that DCCI can be a part of you in implementing those projects? Over to you, Mr. Sudipto. First of all, let me uh, start by saying a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, I know that my good friend, Dr. Zakir Zaman is not well. I wish him a very speedy recovery. He knows that I'm a COVID survivor myself. <clears throat> uh, let me start by congratulating DCCI for uh, this uh, very timely session. And as we heard from Yasi Razman, uh, everybody's actually uh, thinking and trying to organize similar events. So it would be useful at some stage for maybe to, for DCCI to take lead or maybe uh, Marianne Ullers and the Generation Unlimited team to actually bring everybody together and agree to a common uh, a program. Let me also at the outset uh, sort of uh, congratulate uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. Masrur Reza, for what I believe is an amazing, amazing, captivating, insightful, thought-provoking, and informative uh, articulation of the uh, current you know, in, uh, work environment. Uh, in fact, I learned a lot, and especially after hearing such a galaxy of good speakers and industry watchers, uh, let me. I can only basically outline or underscore certain things which I which resonate in my mind right now. To begin with, the first thing I heard that there is immense potential in Bangladesh. Immense potential in Bangladesh, be it demography, be it uh, a track record of resilience, of uh, very productive uh, economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time there are major risks as well. So how do we basically safeguard against those risks and how do we really unleash, further unleash such potential? That's number one. Because what I heard from Dr. Reza, Riaz is that the skills are not supportive of Bangladesh's own development aspirations. We heard figures from uh, Yasir Azman that by 2030, we might actually have a very high uh, per capita GDP, we might actually have a major 
significant uh, growth by then. But what also worries me that the figures that he quoted in terms of job losses by then, if we do not protect them, we run the risk of all kinds of inequalities happening. All kinds of inequalities happening. We heard from Marianne about the digital divide. Uh, we will see a lot of socioeconomic divide if people don't have access to equal incomes. We already know there are spatial divides in, in Bangladesh as well. All areas in Bangladesh are not growing equally. So if you are uh, actually investing in the growth of Bangladesh, you cannot only afford to grow in a few cities. You have to make sure that the growth reaches every part of Bangladesh. Second, what I uh, heard from many of you is the whole area of skills, whether it is soft skills, which are missing, uh, whether these skills need to be adaptive alongside uh, some hard skills, which are basically on vocational and technical training. Now, I did hear again from you that there needs to be a culture shift there. That means there needs to be a mindset shift that people will not necessarily consider uh, any work that deals with using the hands, for example, something which is lower in the social hierarchy, but something that is equally, you know, equally uh, acknowledged and, and graded uh, by society. So I think that is, again, something that we need to invest on. And I, I, this is a work which is going to be society-wide. It's not just the government, it's private sector, it's development partners, it's civil society, it's academia. Everybody needs to come together and actually uh, invest in the civic awareness building. The third thing that I heard is that there is some serious concerns about quality and relevance. Now, quality and relevance is particularly important in South Asia because I know from my own country, which is next door India, you might have a child go through school, but that child does not necessarily know how that five plus five becomes 10. Now, unless you're investing in quality, this is not going to work. We also heard from, I think from uh, Rahat, and I, I think it's very important that I mention this is that, you know, we have to invest not just in human skills, but we also have to instill and motivate young people to think big. That should be brand Bangladesh. Brand Bangladesh, today's the world is very different. In the world of the SDGs, we are not just Bangladeshi citizens, we are citizens of the planet. We have a planetary responsibility. So we need to invest in citizens who can carry those planetary responsibilities and actually think big, think beyond Bangladesh and think how they can serve the whole planet. I heard from many of the speakers that the devil is in the detail. And I think I couldn't agree with a bit more, more on that because when you talk of quality, I think quality includes that dimension of detail. Uh, Yasir Azman mentioned about freedom of choice. Absolutely, absolutely. That freedom of choice is nothing new because Amartya Sen in his development of freedom talks about investing in capabilities. So capabilities is something that we need to invest uh, collectively at one side. And I think on the other side, the government, the government, and I'm here, Asad Shahib is here. I think we need to all work together, public and private both, to make sure that we are also providing the kinds of entitlements that actually is able to give us a much more equal society. We have to have a much more equal society because one of the major risks, and I let me outline this, one of the major risks of any inequality, any inequality, is that you will have an unequal society which will lead to social instability and then will harm, which will have some serious uh, uh, impacts on peace dividends. It will actually reduce your peace dividends. So you might get prosperity at the cost of peace, and then it gets into a vicious cycle where the lack of peace starts affecting prosperity and stability. So I think that's extremely important that we do that. The final thing, and this is an important thing for me. Many of you have mentioned about job quality, and I completely agree with you. I think, you know, uh, all, uh, you know, uh, Azman mentioned it uh, in great amount of great amount of emphasis, and I agree with him that I think it's the duty of any ethical employer to be constantly investing in their employees, not necessarily only to retain them, 
but also to give them the same freedom of choice that he mentioned about, that people can actually go and lead much more fulfilling lives in whatever they want, in whichever area they want. And that's the kind of quality of job that I'm talking about, not just conducive work environments in terms of safety and health conditions being met, but where people feel, will feel inspired to come and do things, do new things, innovate, create, and create for the world. The last bit, the last bit that I wanted to talk about, and we talk about very little on this, you know, COVID has actually asked us to rethink everything. Complete rethink is required after COVID. And one of the things that everybody's talking about is about uh, building back better. Or not just building back better, but simply building better. We have, it's not back better because if we go back to what we were, it's not good enough because what COVID has done is basically shown that we live in a house which has a leaking roof and that roof needs to be fixed. And this is where I very seriously believe that the importance of human values, investment in human values. There is a particular set of, in SDG 4, there are certain set of indicators which are on education and human values. We don't invest in those. Nobody talks about those SDG uh, indicators. Nobody talks about you talk about access to education, you talk about curriculum, but nobody talks about human values because earlier those values used to come from the family. Now with families becoming smaller, becoming much more nuclear, uh, the, the, the problem with uh, both parents working and not spending enough time at home, it's up to educational institutions and societies to invest in values. And I think investing those human values is extremely important because if you can create, if you can create a good human being, you have a much more responsible citizen, whether they're an entrepreneur, whether they're a politician, whether they are a, a civil servant, whether it's a private sector uh, uh, manager, they will all work together to make a much more equal and peaceful world. As far as UNDP is concerned, UNDP actually works across these fields. We are as much a part of Generation Unlimited. I mentioned about, I particularly went on the chat to say that A2I was created by UNDP, continues to be the one who's supporting A2I. So please remember uh, UNDP specifically, and this is to my UN partners as well, they don't separate uh, <coughs> Uh, A2I from UNDP. Uh, uh, A2I from UNDP. We have been, uh, so going forward, we will be working on a range of areas. Uh, A2I itself is evolving to make sure that we are working on uh, reducing all kinds of inequalities in society, including making sure that services, public services can reach the last mile. We are looking at working in the whole area of financial services. I think uh, financial inclusion is uh, something that we're going to focus on. We are going to focus particularly on women. And I think this is an important one. I did hear Marianne uh, Uller mention about uh, focusing on women because if nothing else, women are likely to be disproportionately affected uh, when it comes to job losses. We've seen particularly in the RMG sector and uh, we have uh, Tomo from ILO. He's been uh, leading on work, the UN's work in the RMG sector. He can tell you more, but I've seen figures which are really worrying from 2013 to 2018. We've seen a million jobs lost just in the uh, RMG sector and mostly women. And in fact, interestingly enough, RMG sector jobs, which used to be very unattractive, unattractive to men, the moment you fought and improved conditions, it's men who actually crowded out women. So women are at the disproportionate end of uh, losing jobs, particularly in a post COVID world. And I think this is again, that we have to be very, very conscious and given the fact that the digital, the COVID has shown that it's possible to work from anywhere, perhaps you can work from home. So we will have to invest in that digital empowerment, digital education that is important. Uh, and I say this digital education and literacy quite important because we've also seen the wrong end, the negative side of not investing in proper digital literacy that you will have situations where people are on social media, but not necessarily uh, getting the best out of it, but actually uh, Learn, doing learning the wrong things or being you know the uh, at the receiving end of fake news and misinformation and then actually you know becoming uh, social liabilities so i think as somebody who's been in the country for four years now i'm the tail end of my tenure in bangladesh uh, i would uh, end try to end on a sort of optimistic note i've always been an optimist that's why i'm in development i want to say that 
among all the countries that I've worked in, I have been impressed in uh, Bangladesh for a couple of things. I'm not talking about the amazing growth rate and the, the major strides in, uh, in social development that you've made, but two things that makes me think about Bangladesh as being special. One is an amazing amount of creativity in the country. That creativity is there. You are born with it. That's, that's, the, that's the one which is, which is innate in a Bangladeshi, in the blood. And, and let's, let's hope we can unleash the creativity. And the second thing, and I say this, you know, you know when I was growing up in India, just next door to India, I come from West Bengal, they used to say that there is the Olosh belt, the lazy belt of India, which is Ongo, Bongo, and Kolingo, Assam, Bengal, and Orissa. But when you come to Bangladesh, that Bongo that only applies to West Bengal, doesn't apply to Bangladesh. You have extremely hardworking people here. So the combination of creativity and hard work can make anything happen. And I look forward to all of you working together, including you, NDP, of course, to build that brand Bangladesh, a, a Bangladesh that is not only for itself, but the Bangladesh for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sudhita Mukherjee, for your very, very last inspiring comments on us and on Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I, I like to take your first comment on working uh, together, uh, like UNICEF, NSDA, UNDP, and ILO, and probably of the private sectors, particularly like Dhaka Chamber. On this particular area, probably we can work together and, and, and really do something uh, unitedly for the, for the country and for your country branding. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now request Mr. Jakyud Jaman, country representative UNIDO, uh, to speak uh, uh, as our next uh, special guest. Mr. Jakyud Jaman, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for attending us, although we know we, you are affected with COVID. Uh, but like Mr. Sudipto, I am also a COVID survivor. So more or less probably we are on, the, on, the, on a lot of people are on the same board. So uh, welcome you and many, many thanks for your time um, in this session. Uh, we know Inudio is playing a vital role in industrial cluster development around the world. But Inudio in Bangladesh is not that visible to foster industrial cluster development here in Bangladesh. What is your comments in this regard, along with your comments on today's topics and the keynote presentations? Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and giving UNIDO as an uh, opportunity for speaking in this wonderful forum full of uh, wisdom, full of energy, and full of uh, future optimistic forum. UNIDO is, is a, uh, as UN agencies, one of the specialized agencies working in uh, across the globe, 170 countries are the member states of this, uh, of UNIDO. Bangladesh is also one important member states. In Bangladesh, we started our program in 2010 uh, and working in different, worked in different areas particularly bringing uh, recognition for internet European Union markets record recognition for the shrimp sector, which was banned in 2009. Bangladesh regained that market and also establishing, uh, regained that market in 2014, establishing, working with uh, Ministry of Industries on establishing Bangladesh Accreditation Board. As a result of that, Bangladesh Accreditation Board is internationally recognized Bangladesh doesn't need foreign organization to accredit Bangladesh labor, Bangladeshi laboratories. Bangladesh Accreditation Board can do that. And also BSTI has metrological laboratories. Those are internationally recognized, one of the finest laboratories in this South Asian countries. Coming back to your earlier question in the cluster development. Yes, UNIDO is not as uh, active in other countries, particularly in India, Sri Lanka, and in African countries. The main reason behind this is we are still uh, working on our modalities uh, uh, in Bangladesh, how we, are, how we are going to expand and what would be our focused areas. Definitely cl industrial cluster development but uh, is, is one of our SMEs, including SMEs is one of our 
uh, focus areas. We con recently we conducted recently I mean between July and August we haven't published that report yet. Probably in this November we'll publish that. We undertook a study on 20, 227 uh, manufacturing industries together with build and results are similar to other uh, findings as well. A small micro and small uh, and medium industries are more affected. So we'll share that report with you. And uh, we are focused uh, and, and coming back to today's session. It's a wonderful session. Thanks to uh, Riaz, Mashru Riazvai for nice presentation. He is my former colleague as when I worked for IFC. Uh, and come, uh, my, my major comment, most of Mr. Uh, CEO of uh, Mr. Yassiz Azman, Mr. Rahat and the colleague from UNICEF and my Shudip Tada also covered all this effort. So my uh, speech will almost will be repetition of that. I would like to emphasize the same thing is on done. Think beyond border, border think uh, big. Bangladesh uh, should see it's a global uh, world right now. There are, there is a lot of talk on the industry 4.0, where we talk about data, data skills, artificial intelligence, blockchain, these are things. So we are not sure how much Bangladesh are going to adopt these things, but there will be private sectors will adapt, it may not be in that big way other countries are thinking right now, but Bangladesh will have opportunity to export its expertise in these areas. Bangladesh need also need to think in that way. For example, uh, in, in blockchain, blockchain is becoming a popular talk, particularly in the financial sector and food safety and traceability areas. Bangladesh need to, need to concentrate to uh, think about this one for exporting its, uh, its resources, particularly youths who were talented as Shudip Tadam mentioned, people are very creative here. Unfortunately, this creativity. Uh, sorry? It's okay, it's okay. But we, yeah. we couldn't yeah. hear you. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, this creativity is not reflected in global forum. For example, WIPO and Cornell University published every year uh, since 2011, published you know, a innovation status of different countries. Unfortunately, Bangladesh st stands at 116 out of 126 countries. So it, uh, the creativity in Bangladesh, it is not reflected in international forum. There are due to many reasons. And, and also due to these things, and this creativity also needs to be thought for diversification of industrialization. Bangladesh focuses still on one product. If we uh, think about Vietnam, what Bangladesh earns by exporting, uh, by earning 84% of its exports, Vietnam earns almost equivalent amount by exporting 18% of this textile and, and apparel sector. Vietnam's main exporting earning is telecommunication, 30.7%. And, so, and next to Garments, it is leather and footwear, only 3.3%. So there is a need for diversification and innovation can contribute that area. Diversification, uh, due to lack of diversification, there is lever, the uh, unemployment is, is already being created. And if you see latest labor statistics of government of Bangladesh, Garments and textile sectors employ 3.3 million, of which 46% is women. So employment of women, which was 70% and above, came down to 46%. So diversification of manufacturing sector, industrial sector can absorb and create employment for, for the unemployed people. I mean, I will just touch a last point about the rural area. Uh, Mashruzva's presentation reflected that agriculture uh, will grow by 3%. As you have seen, the mechanization 
is is getting popularity in Bangladesh during this COVID situation. Mechanization played a huge role. And few years back, there was a study that is there is empl employment opportunity of rental service provider of of different mecha mechanized product. There is 270 possibility of 270 thousand employment there due to huge uh, due to labor shortage and huge influx of uh, mechanized products in coming days you will also require a lot of uh, me uh, mechanics in rural based areas one study I reflected there will be a requirement of 10000 mechanics so their skills will be required to develop to 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 give proper support to these machineries. Timely repairing of these machineries can reflect uh, on productivity. Timely transplantation, timely harvesting, timely irrigation are important for better production and higher production. So timely repairing and maintenance of these things are important for the uh, uh, agricultural production as well as uh, skills development of this informal sector. Skills Council may think about in that area. Unido, like uh, as uh, our UNDP country representatives mentioned, we are open to work together with private sector, DCCI government, and also our we are working with UN colleagues for uh, the development of the economic uh, performance of Bangladesh will be we are we are working with our UN colleagues and so and also will be happy to work with DCCI and other Chamber of Commerce in this regard. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jackie Jaman, for your uh, valuable comments. Um, I now request our last special guest, uh, Mr. Tumo Putiani. Sorry if I, uh, uh, for my bad pronunciation on your name. Uh, Country Director ILO. Uh, Mr. Tumo, thank you very much for joining us. We like to hear your comments on today's topic and discussions. Uh, we understand ILO is working to ensure labor right around the world but due to rapid change of technologies, few occupations are becoming obsolete within very shortest tenure. As a result, people are becoming jobless. Uh, they can be reskilled to offer a new project profession, but in most of the least developed and developing countries, people are not capable to bear reskilling cost and employers are not ready to pay the same. Therefore, how ILO can help in this regard. The floor is yours, Mr. Uh, Tumo. Thank you, sir, and thank you for uh, DCCI for convening this meeting and also the very, very splendid uh, uh, gathering indeed. I think we have heard quite a lot of uh, very interesting um, sort of uh, propositions on how to move forward. And I want to use my, my couple of minutes to reflect on that a bit. I think, um, first of all, you all know and appreciate what the ILO's role in this space is. You know that we work a lot in terms of the quality of work, which is really around working conditions, rights and responsibilities. But many of you know that we work quite a lot also on skilling, vocational training, and on employment creation in general, which is very much the topic of, uh, of today. And I would add to that, that one element of this totality that uh, we have not really talked about, but which does uh, form part of this discussion is uh, creating job protection through social protection systems. When we, when we look forward, uh, uh, how to address these current crises. And I think many of you have heard that and many of us will be increasingly part of discussing how to enhance social protection systems as an enabling element of uh, economic uh, development. But I think today, I think the key thing is really on how to move forward from, uh, from knowing what the context is, uh, knowing what the needs are, 
and knowing what needs to happen to somehow come to coming together, uh, making it happen, right? And, and, and from the ILO side, prior to the COVID, we were working actively through the UN system and with the UN system, but also with World Bank and the government to, to look into a job strategy, a job strategy that would be focused on youth employment, that would be focused on increasing women's entry to the labor market, that would be focused on modernization of the TVET and the skills system. And I, what we heard today was very much many problems in terms of how to modernize and how to be more tuned to the future needs of the labor market, right? And much of that is in the government's books because they are the ones investing in the primary education and making it more high quality. Much of that is in the expectations in relation to the NSDA and to the skills councils and the connectivity between the government systems and the private sector systems. Um, and I think there are maybe some of the, the key things that we should look together, how to invest in, in, in promoting the uh, needs of the labor market, the future of work needs of the labor market and the offer, right? I think we all appreciate that there is a, there is a major disconnect, right? I don't see other way in my view, but to continue to work collectively together. And I think that's what Sudipto was referencing. That's what Marianne from UNICEF was referencing. And I believe also that that was many of the others uh, were referencing. There's a need for a bold action, right? A bold action where we come together to generate uh, catalytic and forward looking uh, movement. And it cannot be left to the government. It cannot be left to the UN or developmental partners. And, and it certainly needs the private sector. It really is very much in the private sector's collective interest to, to work horizontally amongst you know, yourself to create an ecosystem of modern vocational and skills training, modern connectivity to the, the future of these skills, using the, 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 the entrepreneurship and the innovation that we all know that Bangladesh has but also perhaps to create an ask, better ask on the government who, who is using resources to modernize skills, who is in the process of developing systems for these foundational skills, technical skills, and to collectively come together to be able to move this agenda forward, right? Because whenever I discuss with businessmen, and I do a lot, and when I visit big companies and smaller companies, one of the things, all those problems surface, right? But then there is that expectation somehow that because it's not coming to me, I will create it myself, right? So I see many big companies creating then their own management uh, training, their own skills training, or procuring that service from outside. And that's really great and good for that particular company, but it doesn't really create a common good, right? It doesn't bring Bangladesh forward it brings that company forward or that group of companies forward, but it doesn't bring the totality forward. So I think very much the UN system and those who are here today from the UN system, be it UNICEF, UNIDO or, or UNDP, we are, we are very ready to support a, a collective private sector uh, action plan and to facilitate discussions through the employers federations, through the chambers, through the skills councils, through the big individual company uh, boards and members to be able to come up with that forward looking agenda that allows for the modernization of the foundational training, which is really primary education and soft skills. Also allows for modern TVET and skills to be built on the needs of the businesses, not just having people being skilled for, for tomorrow that it is not, or skills that are not needed, but built for the skills of tomorrow, right? And also one thing that is very much missing very often, which is the business management training. You know, the need to be able to have the middle management that is able to bring the innovation forward, build those small businesses forward and connect. So I think there is, a, there is that type of a call, right? 
Because if not, then we will continue to discuss. We will continue to, to understand the needs, but we are not really moving together forward with, uh, with, with what needs to be done. And it's not way, by no way is it too late because there's a lot of good investment going on uh, and resources going on through developmental partners and the government in this space. What we are kind of like missing is how to get the best of the private sector for your own good in a way, right? How to work together with you. And that's when I think I thank the, the DCCI for convening this because, because with, with what we have heard, I think there is, there's a lot to be then planned for. And the, and, the, and, the, and the really the question is how to do it together, right? So we in the UN, we have a kind of like a private sector uh, working group, right? So we are amongst ourselves, we are already discussing how do we talk to private sector increasingly? How do we partner with private sector, the chambers, and you are one of the leading ones in Bangladesh. And the, uh, so how do we co connect better with you? And how do we move away from... Uh, from, from um, unmanageable agendas to manageable agendas, like something tangible, practical, something that works the work forward and actually makes sense, right? So that's my appeal. And I, I wanted to use my, my couple of minutes to, to that, to kind of like connect a little bit what my colleagues were saying, that uh, we, we stand ready to, to think that through with you and uh, then also to, to organize uh, consultative processes vis-a-vis uh, -vis the developmental partners, such as the World Bank and ADB and, and uh, Islamic Development Bank, plus the government to come up with a employment agenda that ties in the, the needs of the labor market and the private sector, and that works together with you. Uh, with that, sir, thank you for convening this and thank you for allowing me to uh, reflect. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Samok, for your very thought provoking comments, uh, which uh, uh, we can work together. Uh, because of the time constraints, uh, we, I am skipping the question answer session. Uh, before we, I go to the chief guest or honorable chief guest, I like to give one minute to Mr. Masur Riyaj, uh, the keynote presenter, whether he has any comments in one minute on the whole discussion. Mr. Masur Riyaj. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mobin. I think uh, I'm very thankful to the distinguished panelists as well as to the very respected uh, and knowledgeable special guests for their uh, excellent remarks. I think it. Uh, what, what I just wanted to say that it is encouraging to see that there seems to be a consensus on uh, certain areas involving today's uh, uh, you know, uh, subject that we are discussing. Number one, uh, the, the space, the landscape for employment is likely to evolve, both for technology reason, but uh, also for uh, specific social and economic context in Bangladesh, as well as for other uh, changes that the business, the world of business are going through. So it will be extremely important to be mindful of those changes to be able to identify and chart those changes and link them to how uh, Bangladesh is going to actually strategizing to grow in the future and what it means in terms of uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling the gaps as well as developing new capacities and systems to meet those, uh, the demand from those changes. That's one. I think second consensus is that there is no alternative but to bring together public and private sector together as well as uh, broader stakeholders. There is a lot of efforts going on, but it seems that uh, um, uh, many of them are not well coordinated, particularly not uh, recognizing the demand supply issues around the labor market where, you know, the, the creation of jobs, the quality of jobs and the access to jobs are going to be critical. Uh, third, I think what is absolutely important is to continue uh, today's, as, as many speakers say, today's dialogue is a great start to bring everybody together, perhaps Dhaka Chamber together with ILO, UNDP, and maybe uh, some also uh, particularly NSDA can take a sort of form a coalition, leadership coalition to take this very overarching cross-cutting agenda forward. But today's discussion has to be seen as a, not as a sort of a, a one-off event, rather the energy, the consensus that has been generated through these discussions I think can be can be sort of you know utilized to harness greater outcomes towards moving the policy agenda to respond better 
uh, in terms of creating the future uh, jobs and the skills. So let me stop there in the interest of time. And we'd like to sort of, I'm sure uh, everybody eagerly waiting to hear from the chief guest. Over to you. Mo. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Masur. Uh, we are now at the end of the session. Uh, I now humbly invite our chief guest of today, Mr. MD Asadul Islam, Senior Secretary of Financial Institutions Division, Minister of Finance, Government of Bangladesh. Sir, uh, thank you very much for giving us time and listening to us for more than two hours. We are really honored for that and your kind presence and patience here. Sir, you have uh, seen uh, uh, the keynote presentations and listened to all the speakers. We like to hear from you uh, on our topic today. So I would also appreciate your comments on a specific issue. Uh, you know, uh, freelancing and outsourcing is a very prominent sectors to earn foreign currency by working from home. Neighboring India is earning a remarkable amount of their national remittance from freelancing and outsourcing sector. But due to some banking limitations, like absence of PayPal or payover, etc., Bangladeshi freelancers are struggling to receive their hard earnings here in Bangladesh. Similarly, Bangladeshi entrepreneurs are unable to join in emergent e-commerce services due to limitations in product shipment through, without LC to send in emergent warehouse around the world. We like to hear your thoughts on this to overcome this situation and support the business houses. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, basically, I feel deeply honored to be here at the webinar on new jobs and skills for future business. And I see that this topic is well-timed, uh, particularly in this um, situation that is COVID-19 induced situation or uh, when we see all over the world this sort of economic uncertainty. And uh, so I express my gratitude to uh, president of DCCI, Mr. Sams Mahmood, and also I see uh, the special guests, uh, guest, Mr. Dulal Krishna Shaha, Executive Chairman, National Skills Development Authority, Mr. Shudip Tomukharji, Resident Representative, UNDP, Bangladesh, Mr. Jackie Ujjaman, candidate, uh, Country Representative, UNIDO, and Mr. Tomo Portishianin, sorry, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrongly, uh, Country Director, International Labor Organization, and keynote speaker, Dr. M. Mashru Riyaj, and other presenter and discussants and distinguished guests. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Basically, um, it's a very, uh, the, the, the last two hours, basically we have been, uh, I, I, I basically I, I, I was trying to listen to every, uh, everybody, but I, I have, have, that is, I encountered some technical problems here. So at one time that is, uh, there was a power cut here. So I got disconnected and I was desperate to get connected with the webinar because I was thinking that is whether I'm missing any important points and uh, discussions and everything. Anyway, but it's a very, as I said before, that is, it is a boil time issue. And uh, you understand, and you, uh, that is even in the, a keynote paper that is the present situation of uh, our economy it uh, came off and it was discussed very uh, nicely and very efficiently that is the situation that we are going through at the moment and the way we are trying to overcome this situation uh, bangladesh you understand that is uh, as uh, everybody knows that is bangladesh is moving uh, especially if we think about the pre covid situation was moving very uh, in, in the right direction with the robust GDP growth and everything. And the COVID, when COVID started, then they, uh, we, like other countries or other parts of the globe, we faced uh, some difficulties, but just now, uh, because uh, that is on, uh, the government was very serious uh, and Honorable Prime Minister, she declared uh, the incentive packages and it is uh, right at the moment, it is uh, just uh, more than 4% of our total GDP. So we are trying to manage the situation, not only to manage the situation, but to make sure the economy is, that is the, our productions, our supply and our management, everything is on track. 
But it is quite difficult to understand that is in this situation that is nobody can give guarantee that is will be on the same uh, base of development. Some definitely there will be some disruption. Some there will be some uh, difficulties. And it is uh, true not only for Bangladesh for many uh, countries in the world. For example, the second wave that is which has already started in Europe. And yesterday I was watching on TV, and then uh, the news was like that. That is in every ten second that is one. Yeah, one death. So it's a very uh, um, that is you know, alarming situation, not only in Europe but in North America as well. So still, we can't say that is the situation is uh, that is we have overcome the situation or there is no problem in uh, in coming days. Definitely, we still think that is yes the huge economic uncertainty is looming ahead. So we have to be very careful. We have to be very prudent, and we have to be very uh, yeah, that is uh, thoughtful as well, that is to steer the whole uh, economic uh, situation. And uh, the new jobs and skills for future business, I think that is, um, it, it is, uh, that the topic is, uh, it fits well, very well. That is, if, uh, with pre-COVID situation and COVID situation or even up post-COVID situation. And I used to work as the secretary of Ministry of Youth and Sports. Then I had the practical experience and I had all information that is the present scenario. Basically, most of the speakers, they put emphasis on youth employment. And the keynote speaker, he mentioned about the, the challenge that is the generation of employment or employment generation, which is very important. That is growth without any employment generation that is it is not very sustainable. And at one stage, definitely, and that is, uh, we have to address this issue. The government is very serious. Government is very serious. And you know, this uh, National Skills Development Authority, it was created, not uh, re very recently, but it was created uh, long ago. And Honorable Prime Minister, she herself, I think, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, that is, uh, she chairs the National Skills Council. So it is a very, serious issue that is to the government that is we have to give the right skill to our young people and uh, we have to create an enabling environment for them it is not only to give them the skills but i think that is the enabling environment enabling environment in terms of skills in terms of access to credit in terms of uh, good policy support and in terms of all facilities need to be created for the young people so that they can excel they can create their own employment they can be self-employed or they can be uh, that is uh, uh, they can increase that employability the skills it is one thing that is uh, the uh, a young man or women can increase their employability and yes it is always a challenge to create employment to to give the right skill to the people or to reskill or upskill, it's a, it's a huge challenge. I think it's not a, only a challenge in Bangladesh, but all over the world, every time that is the government machineries, they need to take the right decisions. They need to take the right, uh, you know, the strategy so that the young people, they get the right skills and they get uh, right employment at, uh, uh, when they need to be employed. But you understand that is in 2008, when uh, the economic recession, it was in Europe. One generation, they got lost. They didn't have any steady job. They didn't have any job where they can make progress because job is one thing. That is, yes, I can, that is job, but job, it means that is where they will see, yes, there is a clear path of progression. If they want to move in a certain direction, whether I'm not saying any type of job, but it is that it should be a meaningful job when a young young guy that is whether man or woman finds yes it's a good employment for me and after five years i'll be at this position after 10 years i'll be at this position and in the discussion it came up that is now it is very difficult to find or to get the steady job that is they need to change job they need to change their profession they need to reskill them they need to be very ready to for any diversification so here comes the big challenges. That is whether our young people, they are ready to face this challenge, whether they 
uh, they that is uh, they are well equipped whether they have the right in uh, enabling environment to switch over from one particular profession to another and in this uh, situation that is covid induced induced situation covid 19 induced situation that is the issue is getting much complicated complicated because uh, it's not a normal situation and still we are expecting that uh, vaccine will come and then everything will get settled down but still we don't see any 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 uh, you know that is very solid uh, uh, assurance or any sort of um, you know guarantee from the uh, from from medical science that is yes in next year it will be it will be over and covid will be gone so the reality is that is we have to manage this situation at the same time we have to manage our life here comes the that is uh, that is uh, new uh, it is a new dimension for the government i would say that is we now we need to think about the policy that is the policy support that we developed uh, over the years now we see you know we have to rethink the revisit the whole issue because it is covid induced situation it's not the normal situation it's not the normal you know the scenario the landscape is changing whether i like it or not whether i am ready to accept it or not but it is inevitable and we have to accept it for example the e-commerce it is booming at the moment if i talk about the financial sector the conventional banking or con conventional financial services is being ch changed very rapidly now we see the digital banking mobile banking mobile financial services and i see that is there will be huge job loss particularly in this area because electronic trans money transfer and this sort of things that is that as i said that is the conventional banking no the banks they definitely because this is the demand of the day and they need to be technology based and also we ask them to be technology based because in covid situation people are not only in covid situation the younger generation they don't want to come to the bank so they definitely they'll have to go for go for the technology and if i the more i am uh, in using the technology the more i'll be able to reduce my you know the uh, workforce because technology will help me so it's a big challenge it's a big challenge the robotic technology artificial intelligence you have discussed all these issues and yes it is a these are the great threat to our uh, job loss and it will happen whether as as i said that is technology technology it is in technological development it is inevitable and we have to accept it and we have to we have to think about how how, how i can create new jobs side by side with the automation and all these processes so it is a it is a huge task for the government not only for the government i see uh, my three colleagues from un system i used to work as the wing chief of uh, un wing at erd then i used to work with uh, ILO, I used to work with UNITO, I used to work with UNICEF as well. Then I see it is not only the burden or the responsibility of the government, but also the UN system as a whole, that is to, uh, to give us the right uh, inputs or to give us the right assistance so that we can cope with this situation. That is, it is not only the COVID induced situation, but at the same time, that is the technology technology that is we have to accept the technology if we don't accept the technology we will be lagging behind that we don't want to so the as i am working at the financial institutions division so i see that is how rapidly the everything is uh, is uh, is getting changed that is if i say as i said that is the banking sector or financial sector or financial services very rapid change very rapid change and i i i that is uh, that is it is very uh, maybe it, it i may, i might sound very uh, uh, that is uh, it, it, it might sound very alarming that is in next uh, four or five years time that is the bank they might say that is we don't need any uh, you know that is uh, workforce that is as a uh, you know that is uh, the people the way people are now working at banks in different branches that is from one uh, uh, center they can uh, control everything uh, technologically so that situation is coming so 
job loss not only in in uh, other sectors but it is for technology definitely there will be job loss but so it's a it's a big challenge and and the country like bangladesh that is as emerging country we need uh, right uh, information we need the right uh, support technical support and we need uh, we need to create the right infrastructure so that we can uh, uh, meet the uh, the needs of uh, of our training needs our skill needs of our people bangladesh you know that is we depend on remittances as well it is a huge that is and and in current in in, in recent month very recent months time we are receiving uh, very that is that is a remittance say, is booming and the government has declared 2% uh, incentive for remittance and uh, our uh, right at the moment we are in a very uh, co comfortable uh, situation that is in in terms of balance of payment and everything but this is another area that we need to think of because these people they go to they go abroad or overseas for jobs but whether they have the right skills or whether they can uh, uh, right skills or whether they are well equipped with the technological changes which are being taken place in those uh, that is the destination countries as well so this is a whole that is a holistic approach we need not only to reskill or upskill our people here in in the country but at the same time the people who are aspiring to go to go abroad for um, overseas jobs so you say uh, two types of uh, situation that we are facing and you know that is there is there is dedicated ministry ministry of expected welfare sense overseas employment at the same time national skills development authority and not only this authority all most all many ministries they have their own training institutes that is ministry of youth and uh, sports for example and they have the youth development department and this department they have the training facilities that is they provide training to the young people At, li likewise the ministry of women and children affairs Min ministry of uh, fisheries livestock all these ministries they have their own training facilities and uh, the the ilo uh, uh, ilo uh, country director he mentioned very rightly that is we have to modernize the, these foundational training facilities. It is very important. That is right at the moment. That is, we have the training facilities all over the country. But the trouble is, that is, these are the very old uh, fashion training institutes and they need to be modernized. And here we need the assistance. Here we need the uh, support from the, our even partners. So that, because these are the people, uh, very young people, maybe, they are, uh, they are the school leavers or college leavers, but we can't, um, we, that is, we can't make any progress, leaving them behind. We have to think about them. And I know the need population, that is the not in education, employment or training, it is very high in Bangladesh. And in SDC, it is, a, it, is a, uh, it is the responsibility of that particular ministry to reduce the need population to one, uh, two, uh, one or two percent and by 2030. It's a huge task. It's a huge task because we don't have the information, we hand, don't have the database of these people, who, where they are, who they are, and how, they are, uh, how, how do they live on. So the challenge is to reach to them. The challenge is to give them the right skill. The, the challenge is to bring them to the formal sector because most of these people, they are in the informal sector. They, and they, are, they don't have any fixed income. They don't have any steady job. Maybe they are partially employed or unemployed or yeah, half of the years they remain unemployed. So these are the various scen varying scenario. So here the National Skills Development Authority definitely they got the job to do here. That is to, uh, to reach to these people and to find out the right strategy how to reach to these people. Regarding the freelancing and e-commerce, the uh, Chair of uh, uh, Dhaka uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry that you have raised. Yes, this is another very promising area for our young people. And these young people, they are well educated. They are university graduate. And they that is for them, that is, we have to give them the enabling environment. And you know the Bangladesh Bank, the central bank, they are liberalizing. 
that is the, yes even yesterday there was a, 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 a good inform a news in the newspaper that bangladesh bank they have uh, they are making everything they are very liberal now they are making they are very liberal now and they are um, very keen to create uh, the uh, as i said before the enabling environment so that the freelancers they can do their businesses they can uh, be well engaged with the uh, with the globe and they can be uh, that is their connectivity that they need that is uh, they need to pay abroad they they need to pay fees abroad so these are the issues being um, addressed by bangladesh bank and very that is quite often uh, we sit uh, with the concerned ministry and the central bank they also sit with us that is there is a, a instruction from the honorable prime minister that is we have to create a business friendly or investment friendly uh, environment in uh, back in country and that's why we are thinking about to simplify our banking activities as well because if we notice there is no regulatory bar there is no policy bar that is to enhance or to uh, facilitate the uh, the activities of our freelancer but the trouble is sometimes the old fashioned banking work processes or business processes these are the stumbling block that we are trying to simplify that is you don't need to move from one desk to another so that that is one stop one stop service something like that that is from one desk they, they can do everything or they can do everything online automation is very important thing that's why automation is important thing here as i said before that is yes when we will have the digital banking services then it means the automation so hugely we are investing here in terms of developing the skills of the existing people in terms of developing the uh, creating the right infrastructure that is uh, installing the systems core banking solutions and uh, and real time uh, settlement this sort of things so we are we are, I, i am very confident that uh, maybe uh, 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 that is you understand that is uh, at the initial stages that is to kick off to kick off everything that is we need a bit time but these are already in our agenda already we are working on all these things ict division uh, financial institutions division bangladesh bank finance division all are working together and every time we are um, that is consulting that is we are very open to have all information that is inputs from the business world for like uh, the business uh, apex body like mcci or dcci that is if they have any inputs and we are taking this all these inputs very seriously and we are trying to address these issues so the freelancing and the uh, and 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 and, uh, and the banking uh, that is the payment system and all these things and you understand that is very recently bangladesh bank they are also trying to introduce the interoperability of uh, you know the uh, different uh, yeah, service provider so this is another big step that that is people can switch over from one payment system to another so these are the way that we are trying to address these issues and we are very much aware of the needs of the freelancers and the needs of our young people and and the and the and the phenomenal growth of the e-commerce particularly in the yeah in this pandemic situation we find that is it is the easiest way to reach to the people at the right time and uh, it is uh, it it uh, reduce corruption and other you know that is uh, mal practices so uh, we are putting too much emphasis on this issue that is uh, for ministry of commerce they are working on it and very recently uh, that that is in last week we uh, i basically i uh, uh, took the Uh, national financial inclusion strategy that is uh, to, to to the cabinet and national financial inclusion strategy it is a it is a strategy nas- at national level it includes everything it includes everything it includes the uh, marginal people it includes the uh, educated people it includes the needs uh, of the young people and everything so it is uh, but the cabinet they gave some observations to upgrade it more then i'm hoping that is in um, two or three months time it will be adopted by uh, cabinet then it will be uh, it will be at the implementation stage then you can see that is everything it includes particularly basically that is aiming uh, the national that is inclusive finance for development which is an important agenda of sustainable development goals so this is the way we are trying to 
address the whole um, you know the uh, situation but i'm not saying that is uh, what we have done uh, we have done everything perfectly and and, and uh, we don't need to do anything more no i I'm, i i don't want to be very complacent here because i know that every day the new needs are being created the new uh, customers are being created the customers even the customers needs that is uh, changes then they, they want different types of services. The, for example, if I take the financial services and, and I see that now the bank clients, they need different types of financial services. So these are the changes. The trouble is that is how fast I can cope with these new changes, the, with the new demands and how fast I can, I can keep myself ready or I, I, I can get myself ready to meet these new demands. So, those, so these are the issues that I think not only the, um, uh, uh, the ministry, but also our business um, bodies or corporate houses, they are also facing and we are working very collaboratively. That is uh, whenever we find any problems, whenever we find any bottlenecks, whenever we find any stumbling block, then we discuss among ourselves and we try to uh, uh, get it addressed as soon as possible, sometimes we are ready to change the regulatory framework. Sometimes uh, we are, uh, that is, even we are so sincere to change the rules, regulations, and laws. You understand that is sometimes it's very difficult to change any, to bring about change in existing uh, regulatory frameworks. But uh, right at the moment, financial uh, institutions division, we are working with 13 acts. Just the main purpose of this acts to modernize the regulatory framework and in the name that is modernization means to that is to make it more simple to make the make the, the services but that is the service giving process or service or working process more simple so that the client they can get the service easily and it it it, it is accessible to all because we uh, we know that is the quality of service access to service these are the issues very important because enabling environment mean, uh, by enabling environment also mean this thing that is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the services that we are creating it should be accessible to all and it should be quality services so this is the way we are trying to address the situation but at the same time i would i would like to request our colleagues from un system that is we need their assistance uh, because they have the expertise they have the expertise, they know that is how best we can cope with the situation. As I said before, that is, it is not only the technology, but also COVID induced situation, which uh, necessitates the, the different technology. As I said, that is the online technology or, uh, or different types of services, the health protective measures. So all of these issues that we need to address in uh, in uh, at, at the policy level, and I think uh, this is a, a very um, important webinar. And I don't want to take uh, much longer time because already it is uh, more than half past one. So I'd like to stop here. But uh, I would like to thank once again the organizer to invite me here. And as I said before. That is, yes, uh, it is a, a very big challenge. At the, at the same time, it is a big opportunity for us as well. That is because of this situation, we, uh, we, uh, that is that we, we noticed the uh, phenomenal growth of e-commerce in Bangladesh, digital platform, supply chain, and uh, you know, the, uh, this sort of things, and, and, the, and the mobile banking services, the expansion of mobile banking services. These are the opportunities that we, uh, we, we could harness uh, uh, from a COVID induced situation. But at the same time, for future uh, businesses, yes, we have to be very careful. And that is uh, by if we go for robotic technology and this sort of things, I, I don't understand that is how, it is, uh, how quick we can, uh, we can reach to those areas because these are very high level technology. And I'm not sure that is whether our uh, country is uh, fully prepared for those technologies. So uh, we have to bear this uh, uh, I, uh, fact in mind as well. That is, 
uh, in, that is, we can't uh, change everything overnight. We have to think about our huge population. We can't make them unemployed at the, uh, the, by, uh, by, uh, in the name of automation, in the name of uh, digitization of the whole processes. So balancing, we have to make a very is balance. That is, uh, that is, we have to make our people, we have to give them the right employment, right skill. At the same time, we have to make sure that is, yes, we are at par with uh, global progress in uh, global technological progress. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and it's very um, good to see Shudipto, Jackie Jaman, and colleagues from UNICEF and uh, um, ILO. Uh, still, I can remember Mr. Reddy, he was the country representative after the collapse of Rana Plaza, the first project, the improving working condition in RNG sector. It was uh, <laughs> Uh, developed by me and Mr. Reddy, and we worked together. And UNICEF, the, Mr. Begbeder, and before that, Pascal, we, we used to work together. We moved to uh, many places of the country. And so I am very familiar with the UN system. Thank you very much for the, and the, the presenter, the excellent the presentation, and the, uh, that is very young. And I, I appreciate their ideas. And, and to some extent, I don't understand their everything because it's so sophisticated in thinking. <laughs> so I tried, I was trying to understand that is what they are saying. So that's why we, uh, that another point that I always try to advocate that is we have to put our young people in, in, in the, particularly in the management because the top level management in Bangladesh, they are not technology savvy because it's a, it's a should be, you can think about it <laughs> because the, our top level management always I am very vocal about it that is we need to change our top level management or replace the top level management by the young people like this who can give us the new idea who can uh, who can take the challenge who can take the risk otherwise it's very difficult to move on thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you sir for your extremely nice valuable and encouraging comments on the issue we, uh, the business community, expect uh, uh, that uh, we'll get uh, all our support from you and from the government in the near future on, on these issues. Uh, we are uh, now at the end of our session today. Thanks to our chief guest, uh, special guest and panelist. A special thanks to our uh, keynote presenter, Dr. Masur Riaz, for a very informative presentation. Thanks to our guests who participated in the discussions and made valuable comments. As we always do, the recommendations emerged from this webinar will be circulated to the relevant government agencies, which we believe will definitely help to develop an effective and timely decision on new skills and future job mappings. Thank you all once again. Stay safe. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.